Should I empty your cup? Please. You know, in jazz, that's called a metaphor. Hey now. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Should I empty your cup? <laughs> Where do you get your inspiration from? Does it start with the music? Does it start with um, uh, an idea that you want to get across? It really depends because there are projects that, that come to you because people um, make you a proposal. We're celebrating the sort of anniversary of the, 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 and the theme is da, da, da. Mm -hmm. My mother being from Morocco, my wish to go to Morocco for many years uh, was very vivid. And I noticed that on my itinerary back from Guinea, there was a layover in Casablanca. So I organized with my travel agency to stretch that stay over of about 10, 10, 12 days. And I called a friend who is a writer, uh, Naima Raji, who I knew was around uh, at that period of time. Mm -hmm. And we decided to hook up in Marrakesh. So we met in Marrakesh, uh, and then we took a train all the way down to the property of our parents of her uh, parents, not direct parents, but cousins and furry uncles, they own a datil plantation in, in the small oasis in the desert, in the Sahara. Estate. A family estate. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, everybody is pretty much dead, and she's the only direct link to, that, to this member of the family. So she goes on once in a while just to check on people, and, you know, to keep the, the, the continuity going. So she invited me on that trip. It was just amazing and beautiful. And I just was so inspired by the strength of that desert, by um, the simplicity of everything. And uh, I was on a dune on, New Year's, on a Christmas night in the desert. I, I lay like this in the, you know, the house of that small oasis was the last one in the village. So after we, you know, after we left my friend's house, it was infinity in front of us. You know, there was no other house. So I, you know, with her, we, we went out a bit and we started looking at the sky and it was just a beautiful night and we were alone in the world. I mean, it was just amazing. And I uh, lay down and especially because I had been living intense things in the previous week in Africa, in, in, in West Africa and Guinea, because the, the project was very, very deep and saddening and didn't have much hope, you know. I didn't go home with much hope that it would get better for this woman. Um, so I lay down on that dune, started looking at the sky, and it's like I went out on myself. I was just like, I was out. I don't know how long I stayed there. I remember I woke up and I was really cold. And uh, I woke up, I wasn't really asleep, but I woke up from my meditation. Because uh, that does that to you. At the, empty, the emptiness of everything does that to you. It takes you there because there's nothing to abstract your thinking, your energy, your spirit is like free. It's, an, it's just a a very rare feeling that we don't have in our urban environments. And I just addressed myself all these questions, like why am I a tap dancer? Why America? I'm not from there. Why am I so moved by this place? Why Morocco now? What happened to me in Africa? What? How do I get to all these places just because I'm a tap dancer? What is in tap? Uh, that 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 vague you no, know, what that makes it a vehicle so strong that I can connect on, with human being on such a deep level. What am I supposed to do with that? I just can't keep on dancing to jazz standards. And I was like, you know, yin yang, struggling with myself and knowing the easy way, which was to keep on dancing to jazz my own life and honoring the masters and dressing in black and white and blah blah. But something was so off because I was in my minerality there, you know. It was not a borrowed existence. I felt uh, strongly identified with the sand, with the air. It was very strong. So we went back to Marrakesh. It was time for me to go back to New York. And that one night in Marrakesh, I, uh, I asked Naima, where can we go here? 
to listen to real, straight up traditional Moroccan music. And she said to me, um, oh, we should call these guys we had met on the, uh, on the boat, um, uh, sorry, that I had met on the boat traveling from Algeciras, southern Spain, into Morocco, because they said they were musicians. So we hook up with those two guys, and it turns out they are pretty well off. One of the brother works in a bank, they have a car, you know, so obviously we're not going to just be passports for them or like, uh, you know, like money for the night. Because, I mean, you know, traveling as a tourist there or a foreign white woman, it's like it triggers the relationship of the encountering too often. So that was not the case. These guys were like, wow, that's cool. You know, we take you somewhere where we know you're going to, it's not a usual place for tourists, but you will get what you need of music if this is what you're looking for. I didn't know these guys. She kind of knew them from a boat ride, you know, but that's not knowing someone. Anyway, I trust, I trust the situation. Inshallah, we both get in that car and then we leaving the city. It's getting dark and I'm like, okay, what's going on now? Where are they taking us? And I saw myself captive in a harem somewhere, you know. <laughs> you know, I don't like imagination. So my mind started like racing places. And Naima was like, no, inshallah, it's going to be cool. No. Eventually we park in the middle of nowhere. Nowhere. And I distinguish in the obscurity a small house out of which someone for a few seconds, open the door to get out and smoke a cigarette. And I see like a flash of red light piercing through the darkness. It was like a vision of hell, you know. And this massive <laughs> screaming, playing music, like smoke coming out of there, like, where am I? So that day to, f f you know, to feel hip, I had bought myself a jellaba, and that's the traditional outfit there. Uh, it's kind of cool because men and women alike wear it, but there is like a different shape for the woman than for the men. And uh, it's very wide, it's very flowy. People travel with that, people sleep in that, people, you know, uh, it keeps you from the heat, it keeps you from the cold. It's a very smart outfit, well conceived. So I bought myself a pink jellaba, thinking, you know, I'm European, so pink is for girls, you know, just, just so I knew it was for women, you know, but unfortunately the code of colors is not the same, and it was a man jellaba. So here I come in this place with <laughs> pink male jellaba, which is just too big for me, and people look at me like, you know, what is that? And I look around, and all of the sudden I knew I was not in a very Muslim place, because the women were like, really made up, sweaty like they had danced all night, and sitting on the guy's laps like that, you know, like, smoking. It would, like, alcohol was pouring all over, and the music was just, uh, you know, like, it was like a, an ensemble of little drums, the woman singing and clapping at the same time and dancing with their round hips, and um, small violins, and all kinds of little, little hand drums, and a, a flute, a uh, wooden flute. So, and they just played like fast six, eight tempos, like really, really fast. And I sit down and I'm like, is this place what I think it is? No, 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 they wouldn't, they would not have taken us here. Is this place what I think it is? And then a woman comes up to my nose and she's like shaking in front of me. And I notice that in her belt, she has like little uh, 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 bills, money bills. So that's when I assumed she was a prostitute and we were in a bordello. So what, I was, what, what was I going to do with myself there now? So instead of putting um, a tip, I, uh, I took my tap shoes out of the bag and I went straight into the middle of the dance where they were, you know, the women were doing a half circle and clapping and I started dancing with my pink jellaba on me. And it was like, the, the look on their face, <laughs> they could not believe it, like, and they were like, they got excited, like they started doing the you, you, you know, and clapping in their hands. And the violin came to me, looked at me straight in the eyes, and started this virtuosic 
Bebo from the desert, you know, kind of like melody. And I, I caught myself like dancing to this, I don't know how long. I was so sweaty when I finished and the woman came to me and they hugged me and I had like their lipstick and the thing all over my face, you know. And they set up a table for me. Like they don't serve food in this place and they serve me food. And the two guys who had brought us there told us, it's the first time I see someone, let alone a European and a woman, be served food in, a, in, in this place, you know. And, uh, and my friend Naima was laughing, like she couldn't believe the whole scene, you know, it was just too, 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 um, too intense. And she said to me, wow, that was so cool, that Jelaba groove. And that's how Jelaba groove was born. And basically, poetry comes out of a moment where it's almost an oddity, you know? It's a flower near a garbage. And there's no other words that I can think of but art. What, what would we call that? I mean, I'm an artist, I write, I sing. I mean, I sing not professionally, I dance. I mean, my, I'm, 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 I'm living that. I give that to my child. I, I make feel my my strongest expression is um, the tap. People call me to create something for their audience uh, or for their people. And if no one calls me to do that, I have the urge to do this for myself every day. It's my discipline. It's my it's my way to be. I'm an artist. I used to cross country and do sport. That was competition. There was a prize to win. There was a challenge towards your own physical limits, which goes with the mental. Um, that was sport. And I left because I was an art. At the time, I didn't even know what art meant. Because the motivations beha behind the efforts and the spiritual involvement of Lending your body and your mind to uh, an expression was not creative. It was commanded by a club that you belonged to and you had to win that trophy. For me, that left me empty. And I would win, you know. I was really good. Um, that actually destroyed my health because it made me anorexic for some years. Um, uh, it really brought up really like strong issues because these clubs owned you. You had to compete if you were good. They wanted you to be the one on the spot, so no family life, always on the road on weekends, took a lot of time away from my homeworks. Um, I left sport. So tap is not a sport. Tap is something where I can create emotion, magic, resource myself, share it with friends, with or without an audience. Um, it's a form of meditating, it's a form of praying together. It's many things that don't fall under any other categorization beside art. A day without tapping would be, man, I didn't dance today. So many days traveling around, or. Uh, and you go up in situations where uh, you're abroad and, and the work don't come through and you're there. The goal of the day was to find a place to dance. Where can I dance today like that? I have to dance or my head is going to explode. Even if it's alone, I just have to be in my sound. Because there are so many things and money is not the only uh, reason that uh, distract our concentration that takes away from us the taste of what we love to do. And there's not many things in the world that massacre our inspiration, that just staying inspired is miraculous. What's the goal of the Jimmy Slide Institute? 
for now immediate goal um <coughs> sustain myself and my daughter second goal share as much as i can of the knowledge i received to those who are interested really in learning something uh, in as much of an authentic context as i can recreate jen goldberg came gave a beautiful lecture and she broke up into tears at the end like the tension in the place the it's just so real and people feel like we just can be who we are here people are coming out of the room and they're telling me wow it's like meditation and that's exactly what the people need now they don't need the false we're going to teach you to be a professional dancer for what anyway when professional dancers like us don't even have jobs no we just want to have a healthy good time feel spiritually connected and and uh, work on our memory skill feel the body moving i'm just on that level right now uh, heather cornell has a little bit i mean i've never done so to go there but i heard it from some people who've taken our intensive a work a, a summer one especially and uh, and also came to my thing uh, the she calls it a salon, you know, like a living room, and so in that sense, the setup it could be very similar because I only want to work with small amount of people. If not, I cannot give them the proper attention. I don't want forty students in a classroom. Because I know I'm not going to teach. I'm going to pretend. Do you remember the first time you stepped on the stage at the cap? Mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy always asked you, show me a little time. That meant a little time step. <laughs> and um, it meant you had to come up with a break too. Mm -hmm. So depending on how the break was, you would be told, uh, thank you. <laughs> That's when you had to go back on your seat, you know. Or you, you would be told, uh, so, what do you want to play? Which meant you also had to, to know the title of the tune. Stand out, that is. So that's what happened. I was asked uh, the title of the tune, and I think I probably called something like uh, Now the Time, or Tenor Madness, or something translucid. Uh, Ira Bernstein was there, Tamongo was there, I don't know if Max was there. My people were there, you know, and uh, all I can remember thinking is just keep time. <laughs> I had no idea how to lead a band. Um, none. I had no idea how to perform tap. I, I had been performing jazz and other things. And, you know, like gymnastic, you know, you compete, it's a performance, you know, you have, like it's full of people around you. Um, but, you know, improvising tap in front of an audience was like, wow, I have to be naked here, you know. I had never known anything like that. So I figured I'm just going to concentrate on keeping time. And I know I went off a little bit, you know, because there was no drums. Gee, that was so hard. So I just did my flap, my, heel, my, my shuffles, my ball change, my little time step or something like that. And Jimmy orchestrated everything in my back. He basically led the band. So I didn't have to worry about anything. I just it was so strong behind me. I felt so taken care of by the fact that the music kept unfolding itself in the most beautiful and logical way that I could do more than just keep time, actually, and I worked spacing and try to repeat a certain pattern a few times and break it and go somewhere from the break. And, um, and then the melody came back and I tried to dance the notes, the melody. I just didn't have even a concept. I didn't even have a concept of uh, 
taking a bow or anything like that. I think I probably just walked straight out of the stage and he called me back. He made us talk on the microphone. He made us hold the microphone. That's how I learned how to speak in a mic. So, uh, wow. <laughs> the Acropolium of Cartagena in Tunisia and it's uh, ancient Roman ruins it was the first concert I ever gave uh, barefoot uh, acoustic no mics 500 people huge place cathedral uh, so it was that me and the sound and those Japanese taiko drums and that gets to you, you know, the vibration is real. I thought I was dying Friday night in Tunisia because of the heat. And I was looking at the drummer and saying, man, if you don't, don't call the next tune. I have a child. I don't want to die. My mind was in, I don't want to die. And I started thinking of Steve Connors because some people don't understand at all what it takes to do what we do. I mean, I've been doing this for 35 years. It's a long time. I mean, my masters did it for <laughs> much longer than that, and they probably are laughing to hear me speak about this, like I'm just warming up to them, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but it's, it's, those days it feels like, man, it's a long time. Because during these 35 years, there's nothing else I worked on. That's what I work on to give to the people. That's how I share, give myself, express myself, make a living, everything. It goes through that. And it's physical. Imagine you're on a stage and you think of death. Like that was profound. Like we, I gave so much unlimitingly that night to the point where I saw myself uh, with so few strength left that I could have checked out in a second if I pushed myself beyond that. And I know my limits. Um, I'm just saying this because when we're really into what we do, we don't know how to control it. It's beyond us. We are in the giving. We are completely in the giving. That dance does that to us. It's a trance. And when your body is about to collapse, I had my mom instincts here. I can't check out I have a child. It's ridiculous, right? But that's what I had in my head. I was looking at people, I'm like, I think I gave them enough. Now I have to think of me, you know. <laughs>